This week, we're going to talk about person-centered theory, Carl Rogers. This is one of my favorite theories, even though um, Carl Rogers talks a little bit about being rooted in some other theories or influenced by some other theories. Um, I think it's it has a really strong connection with existentialism and even more specifically with uh, phenomenology. Um, you may not, so phenomenology is uh, doing your best to comprehend someone else's subjective reality, putting yourself in somebody else's shoes. It's very similar to empathy. So, um, you may not know this, but uh, Duquesne has uh, the largest uh, library collection on the topic of phenomenology uh, in North America. So um, they are a center for phenomenology, and, uh, and it is closely related to existentialism. Um, and I think the more modern uh, theories might call this constructivism, but they're all they're all related. Now, um, the things that I like about Carl Rogers also remind me of Fred Rogers, you know, um, uh, Mr. Rogers. Uh, I, I just think that um, you know. Uh, Mr. Rogers, uh, Fred Rogers, was um, a seminarian and, uh, you know, a Presbyterian minister. And uh, I know that, um, you know, I studied person-centered theory uh, in seminary. Um, I haven't really gone into a lot of research about um, whether Fred Rogers uh, knew about Carl Rogers, but um, I think that uh, there's probably a connection there in some way. Um, he modeled person-centered theory uh, quite a bit. Um, now, uh, the other thing I think is interesting is um, you can use, a lot of people think that person-centered theory is, uh, lacks depth maybe, but if you use it properly, um, you can use it uh, as an individual theory very well, um, but even uh, if you use other theories, uh, in order to build that trusting relationship with your client, um, almost everybody starts off with some form of person-centered therapy to build trust, to build the relationship, um, to empathize, you know, all of those wonderful counseling things that occur in the beginning and throughout uh, the counseling relationship. Um, so I would say it's one of those theories that, yes, you could use it independently on its own, or uh, you can use it in connection with another theory as well. So let's look at Carl Rogers. Uh, so Carl Rogers, um, one of his most famous tapes is uh, one of the Gloria tapes. Gloria was a client. You may be able to find that on YouTube. I have a video of it that I usually share with my class. Uh, Gloria was a client with three uh, famous clinicians um, with uh, Carl Rogers, and then with Fritz Perl, and um, with, then with uh, Ellis, uh, R.E.B. 
dt. So, um, and you could compare and contrast and see how those or original theorists uh, use their theories in therapy. Uh, but because of copyrights, I can't uh, share them on D2L, but I will do the best uh, that I can to find some films on demand, uh, either an interview with Carl Rogers or something else. So Carl Rogers, uh, 1902 to 1987, uh, he had a warm family background and um, I think that, uh, you know, he was a very kind person um, from, from what I could tell, you know. Uh, so the family was also very religious and strict. Play was discouraged, work was encouraged, kind of that Protestant work ethic. Uh, he wasn't very social and was often lonely. He studied a great deal. His college interests uh, were all across the board. Started out in agriculture, moved to history, and then to religion. And interesting thing, he studied at Union Theological Seminary. So try to remember who else studied there uh, that we've already covered. And um, but he didn't finish his studies. Uh, he, he, he went into uh, clinical psychology, and I believe he went, on, uh, went to Columbia, which is uh, connected with Union Theological Seminary. In 64, he joined the staff of Western Behavioral Science Institute in La Jolla, California. So remember, Union Theological Seminary, uh, that's connected with um, Columbia, and then uh, that's in New York City. But then the movement ended up out in California, and a lot in uh, was going on in La Jolla uh, or Berkeley. Then in 1968, he and his colleagues opened the Center for the Studies of the Person in La Jolla. Uh, he pioneered the humanistic movement in psychotherapy. Now, this is uh, the humanistic movement is a little different than humanism, even though they are the same word almost. His theory is known as the person centered approach, but that name has changed over time as his theory evolved and the focus really moved to this person who was, yes, a client, but he just wanted to see them as a human being. He later died of heart failure shortly after hip surgery related to a fall. So here we have the theoretical evolution of his own theory. And uh, so in the 40s, he called it non-directive counseling. And, you know, I think the interesting thing about non-directive counseling, we still call certain types of therapy either directive or non-directive, and this is the root of it. The primary place that I call therapy non-directive is play therapy or expressive arts therapy. And uh, one of the founding uh, therapists uh, in expressive arts theory is his daughter, Natalie Rogers. And she wrote a wonderful book on expressive arts therapy um, that I use in my special topics class, expressive arts therapy, um, which is really an experiential class if you ever get a chance to take it. It's offered about every other year. Now, being non-directive, he, he totally challenged the therapeutic idea of advice and the medical model. 
he saw clients and therapists as equals. And that's how I see uh, clients and therapists as well. I just happen to have training in uh, counseling. The client has uh, gifts and training in other areas of life. But we are equals as human beings. Now in the 1950s, he changed it to client-centered therapy. The focus was on the ph phenomenological experience of the client and the client's subjective reality. In the 1960s, he wrote on becoming a person, and that was really his landmark book. 1961, it was published. Um, I recommend it. Some students find it a little boring, but uh, I find it to be a meaningful book. 1970s called it the person-centered approach, and that's what uh, stuck. Um, he broadened his application to schools and government and business, was interested in conflict resolution and mediation, world peace. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize. So existentialists stress anxiety and personal choices, whereas humanists stress our natural potential if fostered. He believed that we all have natural potential, it just needs to be nurtured. So an example would be an acorn tree. If an acorn is planted on rocky soil and doesn't get enough sunlight or water, it may never reach its full potential. But if it's rooted in fertile soil, gets enough sunlight and water and care, the acorn grows into a wonderful tree reaching its full potential. So let's look at the theory a little bit. Um, and uh, I would like you to read the chapter that I wrote for Erfurt's book. Um, it looks at it in a little, looks at the theory in a little different light than Corey, although there are, of course, all the similarities from terminology and techniques. But now Erfurt's book was, um, a book for school counselors, but uh, so you may see a word like school counselor or a term like student, but it's the same for school counselors or therapists, uh, school or clinical mental health counselors. Um, but I do believe that Roger's theory works especially well in elementary schools. I was an elementary school counselor and uh, my nickname was Mr. Smiley. If you ever go to my office door, you'll see some pictures that the elementary students drew for me. Um, but I used Roger's theory quite a bit, and uh, I think it was very effective. It was not the only theory I used, um, but it worked very well. Many times, young people. I would say all people, people of all ages, feel unheard and uh, misunderstood. And I think this theory is very good at breaking through some of those barriers. So the theory focuses on the client's perception of the self and world, their phenomenological perspective. Focus is not on the problem, but on the person. Facilitates personal awareness and growth. The goal is independence and integration. So we're going to talk in a little bit about uh, incongruencies. So there are, if a person is either incongruent or congruent. We want to integrate these aspects. It stresses movement towards actualization and away from uh, the masks and facades that we wear. And you're going to hear these terms 
with Fritz Perls and Gestalt theory as well. Individuals can set their own goals. Now, Rogers would help facilitate awareness, help them uh, to clarify goals, but he believed that a client should st set their own goals. The therapist encourages the client to be open to experience, to trust in themselves, to evaluate themselves internally, and to continue to grow. So here's the term incongruence, a discrepancy between one's self-perception and one's experience in reality, the difference between the ideal self and the real self. Now my chapter looks at incongruence and congruence as it's related to the ideal self and the real self. We also talk about this function of movement and momentum. But uh, think about this. Um, the ideal, well, the real self. Let's start with the real self. The real self uh, kind of has two aspects to it. Um, who, who am I right now? Uh, the good things and maybe the, the negative things, the things I would like to change. But this is, this is who I am right now. And then the ideal self. Well, who would I like to become? Now, I personally feel that uh, it's not so much who I want to become, like uh, it's kind of getting rid of all of the negative things we picked up along the way, letting them drop by the wayside. Deep down we are our best selves already. We've just been influenced some ways positively and other ways negatively. But the ideal self, people think about, oh, well, I want to be rich. I want to be a CEO. I want to get this degree. All those things, they may not be bad things, but are they things that would fulfill the individual? Once they get to that point, Will they feel fulfilled and meaningful? Or uh, maybe they need to find a more healthy goal. Um, there's this quote on the internet that, uh, you know, a child was having problems in school and the teacher said, well, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? You're going to need all this. And the child said, well, I want to be happy. Well, that's, that's a great answer. You know, I, I believe in the full range of emotions. We can't be happy all the time, and we learn just as much from being sad. But I get the idea, you know. I want to be fulfilled. I want to have meaning and purpose. I want to feel that my life was worthwhile. Um, so we might want to look at our ideal self. Is our ideal healthy? Is it fulfilling? If it isn't, maybe we want to change our ideal self. If it is, great. He would say, how far away is your real self right now from your ideal self? If it's far away, there's a big difference between the real self and the ideal self, then there's a lot of incongruency. If you're close, then you're more congruent. Now, I really like these three personal attitudes that a therapist needs to possess. Congruence or genuineness and uh, you know, 
I don't want to be fake with a client. I want to be real with a client. Um, number two, unconditional positive regard or acceptance. I don't have to agree with or uh, accept the negative things that a client has done. Uh, I have counseled criminals and pedophiles and all, all kinds of people, and nobody's perfect. I don't have to accept their negative actions, but I do have to accept them as a human being with the potential for growth. I do have to give them unconditional positive regard and acceptance. That doesn't mean I approve of their actions. And three, accurate empathic understanding, phenomenology, putting myself in their shoes. That's what helps me to make a good diagnosis. How would I feel if I was this client? Six conditions for positive psychological change. They just integrate those three things. You don't really have to memorize those six. Uh, the techniques. We're going to go over the techniques in the chapter that I wrote. So, of course, the chapter 38, using Rogerian theory and techniques. Um, I developed one part of this, but it gives you the historical perspective, non-directive, client-centered, it kind of moves you through time, but it elaborates. It talks about the therapeutic attributes. I think it's an easy read, uh, so please read it and write about it in your discussion post. The motivation for change, that's one of the things that uh, we talk about the real self and the ideal self. The continuum of change is a chart that we made up. And uh, then we talked about counseling methods and techniques. And these are things you need to memorize. Active listening, being present, being there, We're giving the client our full attention. We're not thinking about the past, what happened before the session. We're not thinking about what we have to do after the session. We are in the moment with the client. It's not often that a client or any person gets somebody's full attention. The counselor uses reflection to convey the essence of what the client has communicated so they can see what has been expressed and that we have been listening to them. When we can reflect what they have said. Now, reflection is short. Um, I like to reflect feelings. Clarifying. I see clarifying as two different things. Uh, the easiest thing is uh, information gathering, making sure that I'm on the right track. Uh, am I focusing on the key underlying issues? But the other thing is kind of like... Uh, crystallization uh, for us to draw out the main points and to uh, clarify or crystallize them and hand them back to the client. We're not putting words in their mouth. We're not uh, telling them. Uh, we are uh, taking what they have said, clarifying it, and giving it back. In order to, uh, and I, I, we should probably add paraphrase. Paraphrase is like paragraph, whereas reflection is like a few words. Um, to empathize, uh, to have gentle confrontation, is to point out personal contradictions, um, but in a gentle way. Well, I heard you say this. And just now you said this. Can you talk about how they're similar or different? Do they contradict? And using open-ended statements rather than 
questions with yes or no answers. We talk about group counseling and multicultural counseling. Talk a little bit about expressive arts therapy. We give a case example, which is okay. Um, and then after all the references, there's the continuing continuum of change uh, flowchart. That is the theory. Uh, Carl Rogers, person-centered theory.